you. Amen. If you guys will, please do me a favor. Stand up. Find somebody that you don't know. We are Cross Isle Church. So greet somebody. Get to know their first name. Shake their hands. Give them a high five. Give them a hug. Make sure your mission is to know someone after this that you didn't know before this. And if you're watching online, we want to say thank you and we appreciate you. Please type your name into your chat where you're watching from and interact with our online hosts. Woo. Man, I've got a question for you guys today. I want you to answer somewhat truthfully. Do you guys trust me? That's why I said somewhat truthfully. Because we want to be honest with Jesus, but we don't want to hurt our pastor's feelings, right? How many times have you guys heard those words in your life? Sometimes they come as a question. Do you trust me? <laughs> what a loaded answer. Sometimes it comes as a statement, those infamous words that are almost as infamous as, hey, y'all, watch this. I remember one of my friends one time, he was at his house and he had had a few too many libations and he was trying to figure out what was behind his parents' locked security door and he said, hey, guys, trust me, this is gonna work as he ran headfirst into the door. It didn't work. It made me laugh, but it didn't work. Do you trust me or trust me, I've got this, have become synonymous with both good and bad things in our lives? Uh, how many of us in here are parents? How many of us in here have had our kids try to tell us to trust them about getting a pet that they would clean the litter box every night? Mom, dad, like, listen, trust me, I will always clean the cat litter. How many times do they clean the cat litter? It's a crappy reason, right? Mom, dad, trust me, I'll, I'll walk the dog every day. When if they were really honest, they'd be like, I'll walk the dog when I have the energy and the motivation and the time and the willingness, which is like once a year. Do you trust me? I remember talking with my parents about the first car that I was going to get. And I remember going to my mom because <laughs> she was a softie and my dad was not, right? And I was like, mom, listen, if you all get me this car, I will work it off. Trust me. I will work it off at $5 an hour doing chores around the house, doing all these things and blah, blah, blah. And I almost had her convinced. And then my dad walked in. He's like, son, you know what you do those chores for? I was like, what? He's like, food crazy old people, you know. <laughs> Trust me. You know, one of the things that I've seen and experienced and learned as I've got older is trust takes longer to earn. It's easier to lose. And it means significantly more than when I was young. When I was 10, 12, or 15 years old, all you had to do was ask for trust, and it was given. At 36, it takes a long, long, long time to earn that trust. Because I've been in scenarios that people have broken my trust. And if I'm honest, there have been just as many times where I have broken other people's trust. Where I've made a promise that I've broken. And sometimes I've broken that promise out of good reason. Sometimes I've broken that promise because I forgot that I made the promise. Sometimes life got too busy. But I've realized that trust is both a commodity and a currency that holds vast weight and value. It's a statement on one's character. It's a statement on how much value you place in their word, who they are. And when someone says, I trust so-and-so, that means it goes a very, very long ways. 
And here's the reason why. Consistency in character is hard to overvalue. Consistency in character is hard to overvalue. When you go through life the same on good days as you do on bad days, that's valuable. When you say the same things in public and you do the same things in private, that is a gold mine of a person. When you believe something while you're rich and you still act like that while you're poor, or vice versa, that means that those beliefs and those values are something that you hold true in your life. That belief right there is something real, it's something trustworthy, and it's something that you can depend on as a person. And when you praise God on the good days and you still talk with him on the bad days, it doesn't have to be good conversation, but you're still having a conversation that adds value to your faith. How many of you guys have ever been sitting on top of the mountain and you come into church and they're saying through it all and you're like, yes, and you're waving your hands in the air like you just don't care and you're clapping, right? And I, I always look at Kate and she does her little thing like, and she does, it's amazing, right? And it gets you going. And she's like, come on, church. And I'm like, I don't know the words. And I can't clap, but I'm excited, right? And can we edit that little dance out? And, and, and we're going through life, and it's good, and it's easy to raise our hands, and it's easy to clap, and it's easy to sing, and it's easy to smile. And I love it when we're on stage and when we see the smiles and all the things are good, and the conversations are great. They are amazing because God is blessing me. We love talking with people that are blessing us. When my wife is blessing me, I love talking with her. When the TV's on, not so much. What's hard about the conversations, what's, what's tough about the conversations, if we're honest, is not talking with God on the good days, but is being next to God when we really don't like him when there are things going on in our life and we say, God, I love you, but I don't like you right now because this really stinks. And if anybody in here got sold the lie that when you become a Christian that God will fix everything, I want to apologize because that pastor lied to you. That friend lied to you. How many of you guys in here have been a Christian for like five years or more? <laughs> so y'all know, it doesn't take long, all right? I remember getting saved and I was like, yes, this is amazing. And I was walking into the water to get baptized and I thought like doves were gonna descend from heaven and it was gonna open up and God would say, this is my son who I am pleased with. And you know what happened? I got wet. And I got out the next day, I was like, Jesus, I'm ready, let's go. And I still sinned, and I still messed up, and I was still 14, and I was still dumb, and I, st and I still made bad mistakes. And I was like, but I'm saved. It was supposed to be good. I'm not supposed to be sad. I'm not supposed to be broke. I'm not supposed to be ugly still. I'm not supposed to be fat. I'm supposed to have lots of hair. I'm supposed to be skinny. Jesus, where's my six pack? <laughs> when I get up to heaven and I have that redeemed body, you know what my redeemed body is going to look like? I'll show you over there. <laughs> that was a bad joke, I'm sorry. But what about the bad days? The days when we're not thinking about the glories of heaven, but the hell on earth. The days that we're not thinking about all the good times, but about all the depression and the anxiety and the, the lack of finances in the bank account. The, the tough decisions that we have to make. I remember being a kid wanting adult money. Y'all remember that, right? Wanting adult money. And then you get adult problems and realize adult money ain't enough. You get adult bills and you're like, where'd all my adult money go? And then you're sitting there with ramen noodles. Like, man, I remember sitting home eating a bowl of ramen noodles, watching a video on YouTube, how to put chicken and eggs in your ramen noodles to make it better. 
do you know how much more chicken costs than a back of ramen noodles? Those suckers are 15 cents. If I could afford the chicken, I wouldn't be eating the ramen noodles. On those days, in those ditches, in those times, when God asks, do you trust me? What's our answer? Because when the lights are on and everything's smiling, it's easy. But when all that goes away, it gets a little tough. I've really enjoyed the fun in the Psalm series where so far we've gotten to go through a couple of different Psalms. The first week we talked about Psalms 1 and it was what is our foundation? What is the foundation that we have in life? What is it that drives us and motivates us and pushes us forward? When we wake up in the morning and we go to bed in the evening, what is it that moves us? Is it God or is it something else? And we ended that sermon with three questions. The first one was to ask ourselves, what is our foundation? The second one was to honestly say, what do I want that foundation to be? Because not all the time is our foundation the right thing. And we we need to be able to honestly look at that, honestly evaluate it, and then honestly look forward to where we want to go. And then the third question that we asked ourselves or the challenge that we gave ourselves, maybe the most important one was, what are we going to do about it? What are we going to change? If our foundation is not what we want it to be, if we are not in the place in life where we want it to be at right now, at this time, at this stage, what are we going to do? Are we going to stay the same? Or are we going to make some moves? Are we going to be different? I've heard often quoted, and it's one of my favorite quotes, one definition of insanity is doing the exact same thing over and over and over again while expecting different results. We say, ah, God, I want my life to be different. But then we do the same thing every day and we say, God, why isn't my life different? Because if I want to change me, I have to change what me does. If I want to change out here, first I have to change what's in here. In the second Sunday, we talked about where are we going to dwell while we do that? Because we can move forward in a few different ways. We can move forward in the midst of lies. I'm lying to myself, everything is great. Everything is wonderful. Have you ever talked with somebody after a huge, huge, awful, horrible event in their life and you're like, how are you doing? And they're like, I'm fine. No, they're not. They just don't want to talk to you about it. They're they're lying to you and they're lying to themselves. And maybe it's a good lie because they can't deal with it right now. And maybe it's a lie because they don't want to deal with it, period. We can move forward with just, you know, some ignorance. Intentional ignorance. My wife says that's how I move forward every day. I don't know, but... Intentionally turning the other cheek, not, not deciding to deal with the problems, but looking the other way or ignoring them. Because if I ignore that over there for long enough, maybe it'll just go away. But wounds that stay around fester and the longer they fester, the more unhealthy they get. Or do we dwell with God? Do we not just base our life on him, but do we walk every day with him? through the good times and the bad times. And today, we're talking about trust. Because if we're honest, if we're brutally sincere with each other, and whether you're, you're in here this morning or you're watching us online, this life when we choose to do it with God, takes trust. Takes trust on the good days. Takes trust on the bad days. And that's, that's really tough 
because we've all had it broken so many times and with so many things. One of the things that COVID did, I think for so many of us, is it broke our trust every single day because everybody was telling us everything that we needed to do and needed to believe and we were like, who's right? And nobody was right and everybody was wrong and everybody was crazy. And so we're like, I'm not gonna trust anybody. I remember a doctor coming up to me and telling me this and I was like, you don't know what you're talking about. And then I realized what I said afterwards. I was like, this is a doctor. Maybe he knows what he's talking about. And then I was like, but all the doctors on TV, crazy. And then I was like, but all the other people on TV, crazy. And all the people on my newsfeed, crazy. And maybe I'm crazy. Like, and so the trust just got beaten and, and ground and set on fire and blown up and had dynamite thrown on it and shoveled into a ditch and then dug over in a grave. Like, it was tough. And out of that... We have politicians that ask us to trust us. Boy, that's like putting a snake on your shoulder and saying, please don't bite me. We have banking institutions telling us to trust them, but we We have good people telling us to trust them, like our kids. We have friends, we have family, but it's hard to know who to trust and who not to trust. And when one segment of my trust gets broken, what I've found through life is this, that the other segments may not break, but they get a tiny bit more brittle. Because if so-and-so can do this to me, then that means everybody else can. Because if that person, that one that I trusted for years, that, that I knew, that I loved, that I, I had this relation with, they were, they were my ride or die. If they can break my trust, then so can everybody else. And all the trust, the more it gets broken, gets slightly more brittle. And so the difficulty comes when we read scripture and God says something that's tough. It's hard to swallow. And maybe even we don't like it at all. But then he still says, trust me. And so if you guys will, we're gonna dive into our passage for today, which is found in Psalms chapter 19, verse seven through 14. We're gonna read the whole thing and then we're gonna dive back through in a, a little bit of a verse by verse fashion. And this is, 7, chapter 19, verse 7 in the NIV. Let's, let's read this together. The law of the Lord is perfect, refreshing the soul. The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart. The commands of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The decrees, decrees of the Lord are firm, and all of them are righteous. They are more precious than gold, than much pure gold. They are sweeter than honey, than honey from a honeycomb. By them your servant is warned. In keeping them there is great reward. But who can discern their own errors? Forgive my hidden faults. Keep your servant awful from, also from willful sins. May they not rule over me. Then I will be blameless, innocent of great transgression. May these words of my mouth and this meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight. Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Let's dive into verse seven. The, the law of the Lord is perfect, refreshing for the soul. The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. How many of you guys in here love being told what to do? Exactly. I think to get this verse, to really understand this passage, we have to reset our perspective. I'm going to go out on a limb here and say that there are a lot of other people in here that do not love being told what to do. And even if you say, well, yes, I do. Remember that I know you. 
I've been around you guys for years now, and I know personally that many of y'all don't like being told what to do. And if we're honest, there are many of us like that. The chances of getting me to do something because you told me to do something, hmm, well, how many pigs are flying right now? Right? Like when you come to me and I say, Brad, you, you have to do this tomorrow because Josh said so. You know what Brad's going to do? He's going to flatten Josh's tires. He's going to, you know, put rocks in front of Josh's door so he trips. Right? But if I go to Brad and I say, man, look, I really need help. Can you come help me tomorrow? Well, it's a totally different story, right? We love helping people as long as we have the option to choose. We want to be able to choose when we listen. We want to be able to choose when we follow. You know, there are two people in this world that are able to boss me around. The first one is my wife because she's the master of my universe. I want to stay married. I've accepted my fate. But it was my choice. That's my story, and I'm sticking to it, right? I'm the man of the house. As long as she gives me permission. Heidi's not in here, right? Oh, crap, there she is. And the second person is my sister. I don't know what my sister does. I don't know what it is about her, but when Bobo is around, that's me, and Nia wants something, Nia gets something, right? Whether it's extra snacks on a ride, whether it's extra toys, whether it, my sister loves sunglasses, If she wants sunglasses, most of the time on our ride, she has six or eight pairs of sunglasses on her head. My mom thinks that's the most ridiculous thing in the world. My sister smiles, which makes it okay. Do you want to know how you're wrapped around somebody's finger? When Walmart security thinks you're the weird one. Have you guys ever walked through Walmart singing, I'm a little teapot and Mary had a little lamb in your best Winnie the Pooh voice? I have. Thank God there weren't cameras there. Trust. When we trust someone, we give that person authority over us. When I trust Heidi, and Heidi comes to me and we need to go a certain direction, I trust her. And so I go. When people who we trust pull on that trust, we follow them. And what God is saying here, what what David is writing about God is that the statutes of the Lord are trustworthy. One thing that I found in my personal walk is that I want to do what God says and trust what God says so long as it aligns with my ideas and my wants. I love the Beatitudes. I don't like some of 1 Timothy. I love Ephesians, but there are parts of Galatians that churn my gut a little bit. I like Romans chapter 3 through 8. I'm not so sure about chapters 9 through 12. But what happens is, I love this part, and so I say, God, it is easy for me to follow you here, but I'm not so sure about there. We see it when Abraham said to God, hey, look, you told me in the Old Testament, right? Like, God came to Abraham in Genesis 12, and he said, look, I'm going to give you a kid. And Abraham's like, I'm old. My wife is old. That's not really possible. And God's like, it's going to happen, bro. Like, just follow me, go, and I'll be there. And Abraham liked the idea so much that he trusted God enough to go, but he didn't trust God enough to wait. And so a couple years later, his wife, Sarah, comes to him and says, look, we've waited long enough for God. We trusted him enough to go, but we don't trust him enough to wait. How about you take my servant and have babies with her? Do y'all remember Star Wars where the guy said, it's a trap? Gentlemen, if, if your spouse ever comes to you and says that, I want you to replay that thing in Star Wars. It's a trap. It's a bad idea. But Abraham, because he was a guy, said, okay. Proof that men will do crazy things when sex is on the table. 
Some of y'all are like, he's talking about sex. Yes, I know. Welcome to the crossing. And God still loved Abraham. And God still even blessed Abraham in certain ways. But boy, that decision when he didn't trust God enough to wait had lasting repercussions. But can we blame him? I mean, really, Abraham uprooted his whole family. He left for years. He waited for years. And then we want to look back at him and say, look at how little faith he had when I have a hard time waiting for the next meal. Trust is so very important and yet so very hard. I'm willing to bet that there are a few of us in here today, maybe you're watching online, where God has called you to this, this great purpose. He's called you on this path and he has ordained you for it. He has given you skills. He has given you a vision. He has given you this authority over this area. And you are going to rock this ministry. You are going to absolutely, in the future, at some point, this is going to be great. Because God is preparing you and he is teaching you and he is loving you. And he is building you up. But right now, God says, wait. And when I'm in a comfy, cushiony recliner, that's fine. But when I'm in the middle of depression and God says, wait, it sucks. When I have money and God says, wait, it's fine. But when I'm broke and God says, wait, it sucks. When I, when I have mental health and when I have physical health and when I have emotional health and God says, wait, it's fine. But when I'm down and I'm broken and I'm tired and I'm hurting, it really stinks. And it's not easy. But God calls us to one word. And that is trust. He never says it'll be easy. He never says we won't have to wait. But he does say, that his statutes and his word and his calling is trustworthy. Can we trust? Verse seven says, God's word is good for making wise to simple. How many of you guys have ever been called simple before? Don't raise your hand. First time I read this, I thought God was calling me stupid. I was like, thanks, Jesus. Like, David, you, you're doing great here. Like, thanks for calling me stupid. But the picture that it paints in the language is not someone who has the inability to comprehend something, but someone who just doesn't know. They're ignorant. And it says, his word is good for making wise the ignorant. How many of us, if we have gone through life, have learned that we don't know everything? Uh, I don't know when it was, I think it was around 27 or 28, I learned that I don't know everything and just how much stuff I don't know. And it was a very humbling experience because my mentor sat there, he's like, Josh, do you know you're stupid? I was like, yes. He's like, do you know how stupid? I was like, man, that's tough. <laughs> and he's like, it's real, it's, it's bad. And I was like, thanks, man, I love you too. He's like, bro, I'm in the same boat. The only difference is I know how much I don't know. And you're still wandering in bliss and ignorance. I remember going out of that meeting that day wondering just what it was in life that I didn't comprehend. And it was a lot. But we have a guide. We have something that God left for us that may not be easy, but it is here for following God gives us guidance. He gives us his truth to survive the unknown dangers in life. And here's why I said we need to reorient our perspective. I want to follow God when I think it's best to follow God, but God wants me to follow him because that's what's best for me. 
right? Like, I want to pick my own way because the world is crazy. Have y'all looked outside right, lately? Like, they nuts. Look, we nuts. Like, we going out there, it's like walking into a volcano. It's like, we don't know when it's going to blow up, but it's going to blow up, right? Like, it's, it's bad. It's, it's weird. We can't decide who we like, who we love, who we hate. We don't even know what those mean anymore. And, and we look and we say, God, we, we need to control this. But we've done a really bad job. Like, look where, where us, relying on us to save us, has gotten us. Maybe it's time for us to look to somebody else who has a different solution, right? And God says he didn't give us the laws, he didn't give us this word to control us or micromanage us because he wants to stifle us. And I remember being a kid thinking, God doesn't want me to have any fun, That's not the purpose of his law. The purpose of his law is to protect us from us. To let us know where our decisions are going to lead us astray. I remember one time as a kid in Boy Scouts, Troop 727, in Kernersville, best Best teen years, some of the best times I had was in Troop 727 as the band comes back up to play our final song. And we, we went on this trail, and <laughs> it was my job to navigate, right? Have y'all ever navigated on a trail? None of y'all oh, say, maybe you guys would have done the same thing. Some of y'all nodding your head. You probably would have done better. There are signs, right? There are signs, and there are little numbers, and there's these, these color-coded dots that tell you how tough the trail is. Well, we were supposed to go on a two-hour hike, before uh, lunch, after breakfast. And so we all had like a little bottle of water. We all had a granola bar. We had like one tiny first aid kit. And about three and a half hours into this hour and a half hike, I realized maybe I let us down the wrong trail, right? And so we keep going because now we're sure like, okay, it's better for us just to finish this trail than to like turn around and go back. Three and a half hours later, when all of us are mad and all of us are grumpy, and I'm like, maybe I should have looked at the sign, we get to the top of this mountain and we realize that directly below us is our camp. And we thought, well, instead of following the trail, why don't we just hop over the side of the mountain? And so it was a real steep grade. Y'all ever seen like the side of them? It's not like a cliff, like that would have been bad, but it was this real steep grade. And we thought, well, we could just put our backpacks on the ground and slide down. It was a great idea. By the way, did I mention that our scout troop leaders stayed at camp? So we hop on our backpacks and we slide down the side of this mountain, which was real fun until the side of the mountain met the first like eight foot cliff. And then we started getting bruised and we got down and we went through brambles and we started getting bloody and we got down and about 45 minutes later of the most intense, painful, fun, horrible, greatest idea ever, we all walk out of the brush bleeding, bruised with bandages. We used all of our stuff and our scout leaders are standing there like, what the heck happened to you guys? And we're like, well, you see, we got to the trail that we decided to jump off the trail. We did this and we were explaining this and, and I'll never forget, Lane looked at us. He was our head scout master. He was like, all you had to do was follow the path. All we had to do was, was follow the path. Now, we still got to the same destination, but it was tough. But all we had to do was, was follow the path. And sometimes the path makes you tired and sometimes you don't plan right, but, but the path is still there to get you to your destination as safely as possible. And many of us right now perhaps are looking at life like my troop and I were looking at the side of that cliff. We see the path that God has laid out for us. We see the words that God has left for us and we're like, but I could just jump off this cliff. And it may get us to the same location, but that ride's probably going to be a whole lot rougher. And so this week, as as a people, as a church, as ones who maybe are seeking who this Jesus guy is or ones who who know but are, are still wandering in the wilderness a little bit, I want to encourage us 
to seek out the path that God has laid out for us. And I'm not going to lie to you. I'm not going to butter you up and make you think it'll be easy because uh, let's face it, sometimes it's not. I'm not going to say it'll get easy real fast either because sometimes it won't. Sometimes you will be in the desert for what seems like years. Maybe it really will be. But I want to encourage us to trust what God says. To trust in the path that he has laid out for us. If this is what we've decided, if this is who we've decided to be, let's trust. Why is it so important? Because the extent of our trust will determine the consistency of our life's actions through the storms. The extent of our trust will determine the consistency of our actions through life's storms. And this is so important. And here's something that through years of walking with God in good times and bad times that I've learned and I've seen at this church and I've seen in other people's lives, the presence of a storm does not define your walk with God. Your actions inside that storm do. The presence of a storm does not define your walk with God. Because you are struggling right now does not mean God is mad at you. Because you are having a storm in your life does not mean that God is punishing you. Because things are going wrong does not mean that God has forsaken you. That storm does not define who you are. What you choose to do in the middle of that storm in the middle of that disaster defines you. How you choose to react to it, who you choose to go to, what you choose to lean on, that defines your walk with God. Your walk with God is not defined on the good days, it's recharged on those days. Your walk with God is not defined by service, but when you serve. And your walk with God is not defined by your sadness, but what you do in spite of those emotions and so here's our challenge for this week as we get ready to sing our song of invitation and and go out and be the church in our families and in our friendships and in our workplaces I want to challenge each of us to take steps this week to build that trust Last week, we had you guys download the Bible app and to spend five to ten minutes every day in Scripture that's in scripture, learning what God wants us to do. And this week, maybe if we're already there and we're already doing that, I wanna give us this one thing. The first Sunday in August, we're gonna have what we call a small group explosion. I just came up with that name. That's not really the name, don't quote me on it, but explosion sounded cool. <laughs> Figurative, not literal, Never mind. And it's every Sunday night at 5 p.m. through the month of August. And what we want to do is we want to invite everybody here that's at church who is not part of a small group or a life group to come to those times. And we're going to have fellowship. We're going to have food. We're going to have icebreakers. We're going to have games. We're going to have Bible study and times of learning where we build friendships and fellowship and we gain trust with each other. And we talk about how we can trust God more. And then at the end of that month, we're going to create new small groups from that one large group gathering. And so if we have 100 people show up those nights during August, we would love to have you here. At the end of it, we'll split up into smaller ones where we can build faithful relationships. Ones that matter. People that we can trust. Friends that we can lean on. Even when we don't think we can. So if you guys will, please stand with us as we sing our song of invitation and we pray for God's blessing on this week.